I'm not one to let you. How could I dare? Someone like me who's been mainly nowhere. But in my experience, be as it may, you just have to love who you love. You just have to love who you love. Your common sense tells you best not begin. But your fool heart cannot help plunging in. And nothing and no one can stand in your way. You just have to love who you love. You just have to love who you love. People can be hard sometimes, and their words can cut so deep. Choose the one you choose, love, and don't lose a moment's sleep. Who can tell you who to want? Who can tell you what you were destined to be? Take it from me. There's no fault in loving, no call for shame. Everyone's heart does exactly the same. And once you believe that, you'll learn how to say, I love who I love, who I love. Then just go and love who you love. Theatre, an entire industry shut down by a global pandemic. In the Wings is a collection of interviews with writers, composers and creatives whose work was affected by COVID-19. In this series, we will shine a spotlight on those productions featuring live performances by West End stars and emerging artists. These are the stories of those shows waiting in the wings. Episode 6, The Rise. Graham Lappin, thank you so much for joining us this morning. If you'd like to tell us a little bit about yourself. Sure. Um, so I'm Graham Lappin, uh, and uh, I'm from the northwest, from Manchester. Uh, I'm now based back there after spending sort of 20, 25 years down here in London, um, working as an actor and, and director. And that experience has led me to a point where I got married, had a family, and sort of had to rethink how it was going to work because acting is, is a very transient and, and unsure lifestyle, um, not conducive to, <laughs> to having um, a family and, and wanting to have sort of roots. Um, so um, about... I would say about five or six years ago, I started to think about other ways that I could have a creative life within the industry that was mm. going to base me in 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 a place that was that was more sure and more on my terms. Um, and acting's an excellent prep for uh, for being a writer, I think, don't you? Well, I think all the best directors that I've worked with and writers that I've worked with have had some experience in in. In fact, all the best people I've worked with have worked in other areas of the of the medium, no matter sort of where they've they've been, whether it be directing or writing or um, you know choreography and being. Um, but it helps you. I think acting in particular. I mean, William Shakespeare is the perfect example. But understanding what the actor needs from the writer. Oh yeah, I would absolutely. You know, I would totally say I'm writing as an actor's writer. So having done it, I I know what in a script is useful mm. um, and, and what's helpful in terms of an actor's approach to building a character and delivering um, not only spoken word but song as well. Mm. Um, yeah, so, so I, I was looking for ways that I could sort of rebrand myself within the industry and I was bought a piano for my eighth birthday mm. and that was when the whole thing started. Um, started with playing and that led to singing which led to musicals, which led to amateur dramatics, which led to going to drama school, which led to being in musicals and, and plays on stage, and essentially then led me back to the piano to go, 
ah, this is where I, this is where I now have done this circular motion and I've come back, everything I've learned on this journey has come to this point and now I'm sitting at a piano writing songs again. And I was just writing standalone stuff. I was just sort of doing my sort of Jason Robert Brown, you know, my version of that song, my version of it. And, and, and quite a lot of, not, not imitation, but um, homage, let's call it. And then just one day in 2016, I sat down and wrote a song about a girl sitting on the steps of a cellar, looking down, watching her father baking bread, singing her, I wish, I, I want to be helping you, and, and I can't. And it was so specific hmm. that I knew that th this was not a standalone song. This was a song from something. Well, I think that that's really essential that, that a song be spoken from a very clear point of view. Yeah. For, for musical theater in so particular, but, but I mean, just generally, because then you have clarity. Yeah. Is when you have point of view. Yeah, um, this wasn't a song that anybody could sing. This was a song that this girl was singing right. about and for and to this and man. motivation, yeah. And then suddenly there's a relationship and you've got two characters and three years later you've finished writing this. And that's when, it's get, that's when it's exciting. I, I was the same way. Yeah. I, you know, I would write songs that were, uh, that were sort of poppy and, and I played in a band and then, and then I got into, and, the, and then musical theater is just, it's so challenging to tell a story through song that it's, it's very exciting, yeah. isn't and it? I, and I think for me the biggest part of it was writing a musical was something I always thought I might do. But I knew, however I was going to do it, it was going to be an original musical. It wasn't going to be an adaptation. Mm. It wasn't going to be based on true events. It, it was going to be an, ori you know, an, an original story, original characters, original score. And I think that's probably why I wound up writing it all myself. Where is 
so what was it that that drove you to because let's face it writing a musical especially not just a play but a musical is a year if if you're if you're uh, if you're productive and, and, and prolific you know it could be two or three years of your life and your passion and your drive to do this what drove you to make this you said I have to write this yeah okay so it was a three year process from mm. writing that first song to the the kind of the, the big opening premiere we did in January in Manchester at the Royal Northern College of Music. Mm. Um, well, the song happened, the characters were there, and then I started to think about the world, and I started to think, what do I want to write about? And I realised that wh whilst everything I've just said about the plot or the, the setup, that's not what the show's about. The show is about family tradition and passing on that tradition, recipes, sayings, stories. And I suppose there's no, there is just no accident that during the time I was writing it, I became a father. And we got to the end of the first half and I realized I'd written about a man struggling to father his two daughters after the death of his wife. And in that exact same time, I had be we'd adopted a child mm. and I'd become, I'd suddenly had my life completely changed by this little, nine month old bundle and I was really responding to what was going on in my own life but in a way working through that and exploring those relationships through these people and just the more I went so I wrote that song and then I started thinking about the world mm. and then I wrote another song and then it, it doesn't take long for you to become consumed by and, and I still I always explain it in this way I got to a point where there were these six characters waiting in my dining room, going, what, what are you going to do? Yeah. Yeah. Are you going to come and, hello? Are you, you going to come and find out what happens here? When I sat down to write it, I was like, I knew the very broad brushstrokes of the mm. story. Beautiful. And then I'm like, right, and the, the rest of it, I want to find out as I go. Because then the audience will have a sense of discovery that hopefully will, will still have hung on to what, what I was discovering as I wrote it. So I absolutely, even at the end of the first half when we workshopped it, people were asking me afterwards, well, what happens now? And I'm like, I don't know. Mm. I, I don't know. And that, that was the joy of it for me, was then sitting down three months later to write the second act and going, okay, where's this going to go? Yeah. And then finding out. And, re and, and that, the process of that was just the most creative thing I've ever felt. Do you have any uh, particular uh, in influences as far as writing is concerned? Um, Okay, well, I'm going to go obvious and say Sondheim. Mm -hmm. Not that I at all would even dare to, you know, put myself in the same sentence. Um, but for me, you know, his work, his balancing of melody and lyric, his... I watched a, a, a conversation with him quite recently and Adam Gettle, very much like we're having now about songwriting and about the process and just the need the need for the song. And, and it, what's interesting with Sondheim is how candid he is and how sort of, um, what's the word I'm looking for? He's, he's, quite, he's actually quite humble about his talent and mm -hmm. that actually he, he lays a lot of the success of his songs at his book writer's door. Well, I think if the book writer writes the scene correctly and gives specific yeah. um, stuff for him to write about, then he can write Losing My Mind because he has... A, a, he has a, a specific situation to write about. You know, you the song you know, to write yeah. a love song, he can't do it. You know, yeah. you know the song. You know, the, there's an old saying they say, "Songwriters eat good book." Yes. Yeah. Clever, is he doing things or talking? It doesn't mean a collar on a shirt. It isn't what you know, but what you don't mind never knowing. Cause what you never know can never hurt. Being clever's plain dumb and saying nothing. Having everyone believe you couldn't care. When no one thinks you mind, they never look at you and wonder if you're really wondering what you're so you do just ask 
out your cold. I know you turn around one day and find you're old. Then you hear yourself pretending that you know, pretending that you're clever and you know. usually measured in possessions the more you got the more you must have earned and if what you got is now well then you must have now to offer and that's the truth as far as they're concerned so never mind the lie just tell it for them don't matter that they never lie for you let someone else take charge, disregard the consequences, cause sitting on the fence is nothing new. You know you're letting yourself down, but oh, you're scared to break the mold or go to town, cause no one's told you you'll amount to any more than any man from Millbourne Hill has ever done before. These are the old men don't crawl out of And they say we've only got ourselves to blame Well, I blame them for turning blind and acting clever And I blame them for their unkindness And whenever they blame me Because I cannot read or write I say you don't need them to speak Isn't doing things important. Clever is a thing I shouldn't be. So we're in a whole new era now. This is the era of COVID. Mm. Um, where were you up to with the show? How? What kind of progress have you made? So we. <laughs> COVID happened at a frustrating moment for me. So I finished the show last summer, so that's August 2019. Uh -huh. uh, I sort of let it rest for a little bit. Um, we'd just moved back to Manchester at this point, so we were just sort of settling back there. So I'll give it to the new year, and then in the new year, we're going to do like the, the do world the premiere, do, do a presentation and invite every single Manchester theatre for my money. And where were you, where was this? Where so we did it at the Royal Northern College of Music, which is right in central Manchester. Yeah. Um, and for my money, it's a story that, if I had the choice, I think should be told in Manchester first, and then if there's a life beyond it, then Absolutely. great. But it's written by someone from that world, about people from that world, not for people from that world, but certainly, you know, people who are Mancunian will, will recognise those people perhaps a little more than, than somebody who wasn't. But obviously you're writing something universally that you think everyone's going to enjoy. Yeah, so I, had a, I have a very close friend who uh, works at the Royal Northern and very kindly said that she would help me to, to sort of mount it. Because at this point, mm. I am the only person who's kind of, I've written it, we did the first workshop, after I'd written the first act, just and, and the workshop check. was when? When was the workshop? The first workshop was October 2018, because I don't think you've got any oh, business writing a musical. You're on your own and not checking whether it's. 100%. It takes too much work for you to. If you've written something that's rubbish, <laughs> you need to put that on and for people to go, Graham, it's rubbish. Do something else. So, I mean, obviously, I was fairly sure it wasn't, but for for me, I needed to check. As an actor, you you one ear, one eye is always on the audience. So as a writer, I don't think you have, I think that is, that is key as well. You've mm. got to be thinking, otherwise, why are you telling the story? Not for you, not for you, for the actors, but essentially it's for an audience. Well, an actor. To have an experience. And that's where it's different because an actor has the immediate back and forth with the audience. When, when you're writing something for six months at a time, you don't have any real connection. So exactly. you need to have that workshop. Experience. So we did that workshop. It went well. I then cracked on, wrote the second act. Um, we set the date, 16th of January of this year, 2020, and we, um, I got together my company. Um, there's only seven actors in the piece, so it's, it's a very sort of mm. simple, small story. 
Um, we did some auditioning. Some of the people from the workshop, first workshop came back um, and we set about rehearsing and, you know, um, getting it ready. We did the, the rehearsed reading on the 16th of January. Uh, most of the Manchester theatres came along. Um, we filmed it, recorded it, um, and it was just a great night. It was just a brilliant, brilliant evening and went really, really well. Um, and I was at a point of having some interesting conversations with some of the Manchester theatres about possibly going in for a meeting. Mm. Other ones were tougher nuts to crack and I was sort of still working on them. Um, but essentially, the, the point of doing it was to check my work again, but also to get it recorded and get it down so that then I can send it to people so they don't have to come to me, I can send it to them and, and they can look at it and go, okay, I'm interested in this or, or not, as the case may be. So at the height of sort of starting to push those connections out, we get to March and then by the end of March we're in lockdown and suddenly you, you can't email any theatre and they, because they they've, 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 got, on furlough. they've got problems which are much bigger than, sure. than whether they're going to put the rise on or not. Cheeks, willow pat and gravy bowl, little cup glass bowl for serving your preserves. Women for the bed, every newlywed is without a picture a game of tiddlywinks that's only been played once before and it's all just waiting in the bottom drawer when you're young expect everything will go to plan a conclusion those around you call foregone follow every rule just assume you'll meet the tradition blind you and set to work collecting expectations by the score putting all your trust there in the bottom bouquet umbrellas for a rainy day and a napkin ring so useless when the ring the only ring you want providence will not provide it's time that I have followed 
And I miss something old and there is nothing left that's new. But at least now and again, the sky is blue. So Graham, what is the future? Not that any of us are prognosticators, but what do you think? What do you think the next six months or a year is uh, going to hold? Just continually w working to to keep it out there, to to keep um, awareness of it out there. To uh, that's why this is such a wonderful opportunity. Just to you know, because this is the first time I've had anybody come to me and say, "We want to help you." I think in the immediate future, we have to embrace um, that a lot of this is going to be online, that we're not going to be in the room doing it. And where we are in the room doing it, it's going to be, you know, a half full house. But I say half full, not half empty. Um, but, you know, for, m for my money, it's about just, I fully embrace online. And I, wa you know, watching the NT on at the NT Live stuff online. And, you know, Flowers from Mrs. Harris from Chichester, which I never got to see, which I was just so glad to have seen. You know, all of that stuff is fantastic and, and keeps us engaged with where we can get back to. But I, I, I want us to get back to, to being, being there in the room. And, and I think we need to keep the finger on, on the, the pulse of, of trying to get there, trying to get us back into a theatre where an audience however full, is there live responding to, to new work. Um, Do you have any advice for, uh, for writers such as yourself who are trying to get something going in, in this time? Um, well, time is the word. We're in a situation at the moment where there is lots of time. A lot of people I've spoken to are actually enjoying and relishing the lack of pressure, writers and actors that the phone isn't ringing off the hook with auditions, go here and, and with writers there's no deadline. There's no, so there is. So this thing that I'm, this new thing that I've started writing, mm. wh which I'm, I'm writing firmly on the back of the confidence that writing The Rise has given me, there's just no, there's no, there's no pressure. I'm working with three of my actors from The Rise on it. I'm sending them demos, they're recording them, sending back to me, I'm mixing it, we're all sharing and listening to it. And, talking about our ideas on our WhatsApp group, take this time where there is space, space to yeah. think. And, and that's what I'm enjoying is just, just because it is a time, it's a process that takes, takes time to think about. I keep saying time, <laughs> um, that, that, you know, so having that space and not having to feel the pressures of fitting it in, I think should be embraced. In terms of anybody who's writing their first, um, looking back, that write what you know thing is so cliche, but also so true. Like, just and now the thing I'm writing could, couldn't be less, could, couldn't be further from from my sort of um, you know, my uh, experience. Mm. But the rise is does live in you know, I once got uh, introduced onto stage as the secret love child of Victoria Wood and Alan Bennett. And it's the best opening I've ever been given. <laughs> and, 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 and that's what I feel I've done. I have written this, sort of <laughs> this thing that lives in, 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 with a foot in both those worlds. And, and so if you're going to write, please yourself. Write something you want to see. And um, yeah, stay with, for, the, for, your, for your first, stay with what you know and what you love and what, what inspires you in terms of the, the other material, you know, or the writers that you love and shows that you've loved and stories that, that speak to you. Well, Graham Lappin, thank you so much for uh, p taking part in this, taking time to do this. We really appreciate it. It's my pleasure. Thank you.